retreat talk is on the seven factors of awakening, also sometimes called the seven factors of enlightenment, and in Pali, the Bojanga. And there is a number of suttas on this, but one of them actually is a healing sutta. So this topic is very uplifting, restorative, and very positive. This whole topic, and we will spend the next six talks on the seven factors of awakening. It's very interesting, very rich, and very uplifting. We'll go through the, in this talk, the entire seven factors, just so that you're familiar with them, and then we will go into the details of each factor along the way. Overall, the entire teachings, basically, of the Buddha are expressed in what are called the 37 factors, and these are seven of them. But there's a lot of repetition within these 37. So if you want to summarize the entire teachings of the Buddha, which are a huge collection, 45 volumes, the size of the Encyclopedia Britannica, there is this teaching of 37 factors. And seven of them are these, and these seven are the constitution of the enlightened mind. They're also what leads to the enlightened mind. So one of the similes for this is the, the beams of a, a roof, and the beams slope up to the roof and support the roof. So the Buddha talks about the seven factors being seven beams or supports which lead and incline to Nibbana. They all lead towards that pinnacle. There is another simile of the, the roof and the beams, and that is that seven factors of enlightenment are what compose the enlightened mind and, in fact, lead to the enlightened mind and are the enlightened mind. So the beams, and we happen to be in a very spacious room, which is supported by beams, the ceiling, and these beams not only support the roof, but are the roof. We can't distinguish between what support the roof and what are the roof. So you cultivate these seven factors and they lead you, they are kind of nascent forms, weak forms of what it is to be enlightened. So you can get a glimpse ahead sometimes of a taste of, an impression of what enlightenment might be by practicing these seven factors. Now we will get into the details of what they are, but first I want to just list them. They begin with mindfulness, which is the seventh factor of the evil path. And so mindfulness is the preliminary for the arising of the seven factors, and it also takes part in each of the following six factors of enlightenment. So all wholesome mental states have one particular element involved in them, and that is mindfulness. And not just mindfulness, but right mindfulness. And we will get into that in great detail as well. The second factor is dhamma, vichaya, and that is investigation, careful scrutiny, wise attention to the nature of dhamma, and the dhamma that we're speaking of here are the Four Noble Truths. So to understand and move towards enlightenment, one must understand that all of these 37 uh, aspects of enlightenment pack into, they're like a suit, you know, pack into a suitcase, and that suitcase is the Four Noble Truths. So everything packs into the Four Noble Truths, and then all of the 37, including these seven, unpack from this nice trunk of traveling trunk of the Four Noble Truths. So, this Dhamma Vichaya investigation of Dhamma always implies an understanding of the Four Noble Truths, the nature of right view as well. Without the Four Noble Truths, you can't have right view, you can't have right understanding either. And so these they are all aspects of the basics of the enlightened view. So that is what is meant by the second factor, the Dhamma Vichaya. Third factor is 
virya, which is translated usually as energy, but actually implies the sixth factor of the path, which is right effort. Energy and effort, virya is energy, vayama is effort. Usually the translation, these are the English translations, are really indistinguishable. And when you look at the sixth factor, right effort, sama vayamo, the the instructions in it are to stir up energy. In order to get these states to make the right effort, you actually have to stir up energy. So it, it's very hard to distinguish between energy and effort. Basically, effort is well-directed energy. There's all kinds of misdirected energy, but right-directed energy is what right effort is. So this factor of the enlightenment factors is actually the sixth factor of the path. And this, by the way, is, we talked before about this huge collection called the 37 aspects of the teaching. And this right effort occurs nine times. Nine of those are repetitions of the 37. Right effort is repeated nine times. It's very, very frequent uh, factor in this. Mindfulness recurs eight times. So these are incredibly important factors and they occur again and again and again in all of these different configurations. So what the Buddha is doing is giving a whole bunch of patterns and, and possibilities, ways into the Dhamma. And there are short forms, medium forms, long forms, exhaustive forms, things that are easy to grasp by certain people and other ones that are more difficult to grasp and some that are meant for people who have a lot of intelligence and careful abstract thinking processes and others that are more based on just intuition or faith. Now we come to the results of this energy which is it spills out into joy and so we get to the emotional part. Joy is basically just a form of happiness. The the Pali word is PT, and uh, it is something which has been translated as joy. The people who translated the first English translations were probably from 19th century Britain, Oxford educated people, and joy at the time meant sort of a, a condition of happiness. You shouldn't take the translation too literally, you should explore what is meant by this factor, this PT. Um, PT is, is just a form of fairly energetic and active happiness. But it's in the context of the Four Noble Truths, the Dhamma. So it's not the happiness of a child who gets ice cream or an adult who uh, wins the lottery or something like this. It's not that kind of happiness. It's it shares the emotional qualities of that, but it's based on something else. And of course, it's based within the Eightfold Path. And it's based on the development of usually virtue and an attitude towards the world. One is has a different view of the world, which relieves you from the endless ups and downs of the chase after momentary a uh, few drops of, of happiness here and there and some severe bee stings every now and then as well. So it removes you from that world which is only very brief and temporary types of happiness into a state which is more conducive to a sustained joy and well-being. It's the relief more or less from the ordinary chase which ordinary people are engaged in the endless pursuit of something that will get them through the next few minutes. So there's a quality of joy that arises from this, this spiritual joy. There's no one in other traditions as well, you know, in certain philosophical traditions, that, that is living philosophical traditions where a person is, is pursuing a, a wisdom kind of philosophy. And in certain other religious traditions as well, they, there's an understanding of the rising of of spiritual joy 
and this is the withdrawal from the ordinary chase and uh, pursuit of worldly experience, more or less the sensory, the world of the senses. This leads to a next factor, pasadi, which is uh, tranquility. So the joy is settling down into a more mellow type of energy, which is exquisite as well. And it, so usually the, the way we think about these is that the first four factors are very active. As you can see, energy and joy, these are very active. Investigation of dhamma, very active. And mindfulness is behind all these things. Mindfulness itself is, is active. It's a factor of the mind which retains attention on a specific topic and allows the process of investigation of dhamma the process of the stirring up of energy, that is right effort, and the processes of sustaining joy in an unworldly joy, a non-sensory type of joy. Mindfulness is present and active in all of these things. It is overlooking the, the process, supporting those processes. Now we come into the side which is more passive, quieter, and accomplished, and now these three factors all have that aspect. So pasadi, which is translated basically as tranquility, is this that the, the normal uh, psychic irritants and distractions have settled down. And you are now in a, in a, in a very pleasant condition. This is a preliminary to deeper concentration, deeper stillness, and it's the kind that you walk around with that goes with you in ordinary activities as well. So this is where the five hindrances, and we will get in much more deeply into describing the five hindrances, have subsided, but one is not necessarily in the deep samadhi or deep, uh, what we call jhana or concentration. It's possible to walk around in the world with the absence of the five hindrances, and you're in a kind of on the edge of a samadhi state. And by the way, joy has not disappeared. Joy can be a part of this tranquility. It's, it's subsiding towards a deeper stillness, and it's passing through a very beautiful, but less than intensely focused samadhi. Samadhi is the next factor, it's the sixth factor. And so the sixth factor is the four jhanas, basically. So what, what you start to see overall is the last three factors of the Eightfold Path. So we have right effort, as in virya. We have right mindfulness, which is listed explicitly as the first factor. And then we have right samadhi or sama samadhi, the right concentration, the eighth factor of the path, are in the seven factors of awakening. Samadhi is the eighth factor of the path, and then we have, it graduates into equanimity, and that's interesting. The fourth jhana, the fourth, the deepest of the, the rupa jhanas, the ones that are explicitly listed as the eighth factor of the path, is primarily composed of this equanimity that is deep and enduring stillness, perfect balance. There is another type of equanimity. So this is, you know, basically what we see here is that the last three factors of the Eightfold Path have been put under a magnifying glass. And you can start to see details. It's all of the focus of the seven factors of awakening are they're a blow-up and addition of the last three factors of the Eightfold Path. These factors are called the higher development of the mind, the adhichitta. This is the this is where what we would call meditation. When the Buddha introduces the Eightfold Path to people or the Four Noble Truths, he doesn't actually expect that everybody is going to be a meditator. He's going to give some very beneficial teachings to people. Many of the lay people are 
very busy with life in general. They have lots of kids and jobs and all kinds of issues in their lives. And they're going to try to do as, as best they can. They're going to develop, hopefully will develop at least virtue. Even before that, perhaps generosity. They may not get to the point where they even can maintain the five precepts, which we will talk about. But they perhaps can, can offer a few gifts to people from time to time, and that will uplift their lives. They will start to experience this this expansive feeling of generosity rather than its opposite, which is a form of just selfishness, which tends to be a very dry experience. So the last three factors of the path are really meditative path factors. They're put under the microscope with the seven factors of enlightenment, and so you start to see that. It, uh, it will make a lot more sense to you if you think about it as that way. So you can see, we start with mindfulness, the seventh factor. Then investigation, we're investigating with, with mindfulness. Now this investigation is a form of what, what we would call um, wise attention, a yoniso manasikara, and could result in something called vipassana. Now many of you are, have heard about vipassana as a kind of a meditation technique which is a very, it's a, somewhat of a misuse of the word. It, what it means to, is to see clearly, but it's not necessarily the process of seeing clearly, it's the result. It's what results in seeing clearly. So this dhamma vichaya, this vichaya, is the investigation, and it's, it's utilizing mindfulness. So here's the, this, what we would call the practice of samatha vipassana, serene reflection. And these factors of enlightenment are describing this in detail. Mindfulness is fully there. This investigation and scrutiny is fully there, applying it to the, to the suggested topics. And then we have right effort, the sixth factor coming up, and then we have joy, which is also the a characteristic emotion of the first jhana. So PT is always included in the description of the first jhana, which is samadhi, the eighth factor of the path. But it doesn't have to be exclusively in the, the jhana factor. There's, it, fortunately for us, that you don't have to be in jhana to have spiritual joy. There is another form of joy which is active and you can have it while walking around in the world, while washing the dishes, while talking to somebody. This can be maintained in the activities of daily life. And so that's why it's included in a preliminary to the actual arrival of the of samadhi, which is the sixth factor of the seven factors of enlightenment. The joy that arises in the sixth factor, in the samadhi factor, is a type of joy that is exclusive to jhana. And so we, you get uh, two bennies from, from this experience. You get the active joy from uh, living, and it, this can be maintained, by the way, virtually indefinitely all day long. You can exist in a feeling of lightness and joy. And you can also uh, tip over into serenity from time to time as well. So this is the experience of being on a, on a bicycle. Sometimes you're pedaling and the wind is blowing through your hair and um, you feel very joyful, but then you come to a little downhill and you don't have to pedal anymore, you just coast. So you're going from the active, the joyful, to a, a moment of serenity, and this back and forth between these two things. And this can go on all day long if you have put in the preliminary causes for these. These are the, these are the conditions which the enlightened person experiences. So sometimes Buddhism is, is presented as a rather pessimistic type of teaching. It's the very opposite. It's the, it's encouraging a super normal experience of what we would call the most positive of human emotions. And 
it is not some most people think well every now and then you're happy and then you gotta you have to be sad in order to really appreciate happiness don't you you can't be happy all the time i've heard this before i like to ask people well can you be sad all the time yeah of course <laughs> so you don't have you can't not be sad all the time if you can be sad all the time then you can be happy all the time as well they they don't have to uh, function as a duality it's not true that that you get tired of being happy all the time no <laughs> so it's possible to enter into these positive states and remain in them but this doesn't just follow the sky on you this is not grace from above this is this is not an accident either of genetics or something like this this is uh, the result of training so the Buddha is giving you detailed instructions for the cultivation and training and maintenance of this so this whole process is again what we would call the gardening process we are going to systematically examine what it is that produces negative emotional states and we're going to do something about that and then we're going to examine what are the positive mental states and emotional states and we're going to learn how to contact them and then not let them just fly away we're going to actually cultivate them and until we can get them actually fully in our command so this is uh, an exercise in uh, gardening until you can get the vegetables that you want to appear in your garden and the flowers that you want to appear you want both nourishment and beauty and these are the factors this is a this is a systematic gardening exercise and it's not it's not accidental it's not it, it has nothing to do with grace or any of these things you do this by understanding and systematic practice and the seven factors are what describe this they also are the path to this the development of it and the sustaining and perfection of it so when the seven factors are perfected that is the condition of full enlightenment so now you get an insight into the mind of the fully enlightened person and the emotional condition of the fully enlightened person as well they are unshakably attentive through mindfulness but not just mindful of anything in a very specific way they maintain mindfulness but it's with it's a form of effortless mindfulness they continue to investigate dhamma or the understanding of how this process has taken place and works partly for their own they, so that they're clear themselves about the internal processes but to some degree so that they can communicate it to others not all enlightened people are very good at telling other people how to follow the path this is the case for a lot of things uh, for instance uh, some people are very gifted musically they can they can sing they can play but they can't teach anybody else how to do it they can't explain how they do it they don't know how they do it but they're they can do it so this is the case for enlightened people you may be surprised to find out that they all can't explain what's going on with them but they 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 can have this you know and to some degree a person an ordinary person has to take their word for it that they're when we say enlightened, I mean, this is a, a term that is so widely used. And if you want more explanation of what enlightenment is, I have several talks on, uh, on the stages of enlightenment, because these are very specifically and precisely described what is meant by these words by the Buddha. And uh, some people can explain it and, and articulate it, and others cannot. And so this is the Dhamma Vichaya for an enlightened person, the investigation of Dhamma continues, and it helps them also articulate it for others. You will actually see that after the Buddha's enlightenment himself, that he spent some time going through ways of explaining this to people. And you see this idea of the development of dependent origination, the explanational 
form, dependent origination, after, after his enlightenment, he understood something in the process of his awakening, which was, is a very brief time. The, the actual process itself took a very brief time, but was preceded by a long, long, um, multi-lifetime process. But the actual event takes place in a very brief period of time. The after effect is that how do I best communicate this? And that requires sorting out, you know, how, what some people can understand, what other people can understand, how shall I present this? So that continues for the enlightened person. <laughs>